Everyone, this is Ross Raddy, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast-style video that I do for you guys. Every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern, we talk all about fruits, vegetables, how to use that stuff in the kitchen, how to grow it, um, the really rare things, things that are really interesting, probably things you've never heard of in the fruit and vegetable world. In today's video, we're going to talk about my five goals for the 2019 season. That's orchard goals and also goals for the garden. Um, I want to make one quick uh, announcement before we get into that is that we actually have some plants for sale on figbid.com. Um, you can go down in the description of this video um, and you guys can see the link there to the figbid listings that I have available for sale. Right now we're selling raspberry plants. So I think we have some persimmon cuttings left over um, or persimmon cuttings that I'm going to cut. We did sell out on all the fig cuttings, but very soon we're going to have lots of fig trees for sale of very rare and interesting varieties that um, a lot of you guys have been asking me where I get them from, how to get them. Well, I've got them and I'm really making them available to people. So if you're interested, it's all going to be on FigBid. No need to send me a personal message. Whatever is listed is what is available. So the goals for this season number one has got to be revolving around the figs I mean it's the number one goal every single year is to improve 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 get higher quality get earlier fruits um, you name it we're doing so many things this year I can make a whole video just on this particular topic I really could um, one thing we're gonna do is really try to reduce the water that my pots are getting now of course, we can control this with drip irrigation and setting that up on a timer and controlling the exact amount of water. But we're going to take this a step further. We're going to cover the pots with plastic so that any excess water from the rain is not going to get into my pots. I want to control the exact amount of water, especially in September and October when that is the most important. Um, the quality just gets greatly diminished at those times of the year because of that rain. Um, Let's see, what else? I also want to improve my tagging system. We are, of course, labeling the plants as we go, but we're going to be doing lots of things. We've talked about this maybe in an episode of Fruit Talk, but definitely on the YouTube channel. All about keeping track of really important data on each individual variety of fig, so that way we can quantify the data and make better informed decisions on what varieties we're going to be culling, because at the end of this year, we're going to be culling quite a few varieties. We're also planting roughly 50 varieties of figs in the ground as a really big experiment. I figured out really how I want to plant them, where I want to plant them, how to really increase my success so that I can get a number of varieties to survive the winter time with either zero or minimal damage. Um, we're really improving our techniques as we go along. It really is all about that preparation. We've done plenty of videos, by the way, on this, but it really is all that preparation um, when you plant the tree. Really, really doing all that stuff at planting time, making sure you've got the right site selection, you're adding in lots of thermal mass, you're planting it at the appropriate height, um, also just not watering them, at least in my climate. Water is the enemy. So uh, if you live in Arizona, California, you guys are going to be trying to conserve water and, and get water. But here in my climate, water is a big no-no. Um, there's a whole really a long list of things revolving around that. We're also propagating. We've been propagating all winter. We've talked a lot about rooting fig cuttings. We are going to be propagating very, very specific varieties uh, we've already kind of been on this journey. We've talked about the most exciting varieties I'm looking forward to. Uh, we talked about my top varieties for this location. Um, these are the varieties that I'm going to be making multiple copies of. And I've already made many copies of Smith. That's a big one. Um, that was the first one that I really decided to go all in on. Uh, because in an effort to really cull down a lot of these varieties we're sitting at somewhere at maybe 200 varieties I mean it's it we're getting up there it just keeps getting bigger and bigger every year um, you know at some point we have to make some culling um, decisions here we have to make some big culls get rid of a lot of varieties 
we've already done this. We've done this over the years. Two years ago, I got rid of 40 varieties. Uh, last year, I think I got rid of about 20, 20 different varieties. So we're not really getting rid of as much as we should, but there's been some really interesting things. A lot of interesting people have come into the fig community and have really introduced some interesting varieties that I just couldn't pass up. Now that we've kind of gotten through that and I've really gotten through the, the crap, um, we can really make some informed decisions with the quantifying of the data, uh, you know, and then come in here with varieties that I know are proven to be successful that are going to be top, top tier varieties here in my climate. I have a feeling that one, of course, is Smith. I have another feel feeling, a uh, very strong feeling that Pastelliere is another one as well as uh, another fig called Campaneri. I think those will be probably in my top three. Aishia Black maybe uh, will be the next the next one into that as well. We'll have to see what happens with this season. Another big goal is to find different flavor categories, and that's why I've got this photo up here for you. For those of you guys who are watching on YouTube, um, this flavor uh, categories here is in the spreadsheet in all the descriptions of my videos. We break in this down every single year and described, you know, really what um, the differences are in the flavors of figs. And without a doubt, I have to say that uh, we're getting more and more information as we go along, as we taste different varieties. Things are becoming a bit more clear. And I think there's even more flavor categories out there that I've yet to come across. So we're really going to be interested in in trying some different varieties that I think could fill a whole new slot in terms of flavor. I think Cora Black is probably one of those figs. We'll see. Maybe uh, Grease Olivet. Um, there's a few figs I added this year that might be able to fill that gap. Also, um, the second goal of the year, because we covered a lot on figs. Again, I could do an entire video on this. But the second goal of the year is actually to improve our melon production. Uh, we talked lots about melons in other episodes of Fruit Talk. And melons are my new big thing because, one, they're so incredibly tasty. I went to Japan, fell in love with a melon that we got to try there called the Andes Melon. Was absolutely blown away. The, the prices of melons there are, are in, insane, by the way. And for good reason, because the melon quality is astronomically better than it is in the United States. A melon that you can get at the grocery store is complete and utter trash compared to a melon that I can get in Japan. Or a melon that you can grow yourself. I've done a lot of research. We got a book by Amy Goldman. We picked out many varieties of melons, all heirlooms. We are doing a really large effort especially with melons because it's very easy to save seed from melons um, and you got to have heirlooms if you want to save seed right you can save the hybrids but they're not always going to be exact exactly true to type but um, you know this is a real special endeavor that I'm going to be on and hopefully it will continue this for years this is going to be my second biggest focus of the year is getting a high quality melon production out of my garden. We're going to grow them vertically as single stem plants. We're going to limit the number of melons per plant. And again, we're growing very special varieties that have adapted over the years, have formed very interesting flavors. The one you're looking at here is called Noir de Carmes. This is a French variety, I believe. Yeah, a French cantaloupe. And what most people don't know about melons is that there really is no such thing as a honeydew, I believe. Um, if I remember correctly from reading Amy Goldman's book, is that cantaloupes are really the types of melons that you want to look for. Um, and most cantaloupes, um, all cantaloupes, do not have that that netting on the out exterior there. So, hopefully, I'm right on that. I think that's pr I think that's accurate, but. Um, yeah, it's those are the kind of melons that I'm looking for. Also, the Charente type melons, the ones that really have a exquisite flavor that 
are probably going to be very difficult to maintain. And hopefully out of this whole process here of me trialing about 20 different varieties of melons, somewhere around there, we can find one or two that are really exceptional and are well adapted to my climate, the humidity here. Also, hopefully we'll do well with Fusarium wilt if we run into that this year. I'm really crossing my fingers that we don't. And uh, also produce a fantastic melon. So that's the goal with the melons. The next biggest goal uh, is the tomatoes, I think. We put a lot of effort in tomatoes every year. Without a doubt, growing them as single stem plants vertically, just like the melons, is the best way that I have found to grow them. Uh, we get them at much later in the season because we don't have blight. We don't have blossom end rot. We have no disease problems on our tomatoes. Even though we get 40 inches of rain, we have a very rainy fall, very rainy summers. I have absolutely no problems. I get some cracking here and there, and that's about it. Again, we're doing a very... Um, heirloom style planting this year almost everything I'm growing is heirlooms no hybrids uh, with the tomatoes we did actually get in uh, very heavily into Amy Goldman's book as well found some really special varieties uh, even some current tomatoes I'm trying out a current variety this year I'm also trying uh, a number of different um, cherry tomatoes we're trying some salad tomatoes, we're trying some big beefsteak tomatoes, and we're also growing tomatoes for sauce. And I've done some really good digging around and trying to find some great paste tomatoes to make some incredible sauce. We're gonna be um, trying to get as much water out of these tomatoes as possible. I do not water my tomatoes, I do not water my melons, do not water my figs very much. All of that should be dry farmed. The less water, the better the flavor, the better the bricks really does increase that flavor now the other thing we're going to do with the sauce tomatoes the paste tomatoes is that we're going to hang them up we're going to string them up let them dry a little bit let them get rid of some of that water and we're going to have a real intense tomato sauce um i've seen it i've got to try it at this restaurant at um the italian market in philadelphia it's called monsu they told me exactly how they do their tomatoes i was blown away by how flavorful they were and I bet you the varieties that they're using are just your standard Roma type. Think about if I'm using some real interesting heirloom paste tomatoes. Uh, it's just gonna blow. It's just gonna blow me away. I think I'm gonna be addicted. We're gonna can a lot of it. Have sauce hopefully for the entirety of the year, etc. The fourth goal of the year is going to be revolving around vegetables and particularly getting things that are more problem free, easier to grow. Swiss chard is the first one that comes to mind. It lasts all season long from the beginning of the season, even all the way through December we were getting it. It was still growing. It was still living outside. We're also going to focus on season extension in the fall. I think I'm really going to build some... Um, we're going to build some of those glass door things. What are those things called? Oh, my God. They're wooden boxes with glass on them. <laughs> Essentially, that's a season extension, kind of like a mini hoop house. Um, and that's what we're going to do, really, is focus on varieties and also different species that will survive the winter, that will survive the heat of the summer, that are just really well adapted. We've, we've put a lot of time into researching some Asian varieties of vegetables, things like Chinese broccoli, kailan, things like choy sum, komatsuna, tatsui bok choy as well things that are really just going to put up with the earlier part of our season right that's not necessarily very difficult to grow in but then we've got things that will do exceptionally well throughout the heat of our summer they won't bolt they're very easy to grow they're hopefully pest free or pest resistant and uh, we'll have a really amazing summer of vegetables that's my that is a big goal of mine uh, the next goal here is revolving around persimmons and pomegranates. As my number two and third favorite fruit, and having them so for so long now, and growing them for so long now, and uh, being obsessed with them for so long, I really want the fruit numbers to crank it up. We've got about 12 different varieties of pomegranates. A lot of them have 
flowered but haven't bared. And it seems like um, they're putting out male flowers or only putting out female flowers. They're not putting out both. And I'm having really a bit of an issue getting them pollinated. I may have to hand pollinate a lot of these things. Um, really focus on, as we've done in the past, really letting them go. We're not pruning them. We're letting them form hopefully spurs. They're getting to a really old age now. They're in their third or fourth year for a lot of them. And this is really the time they're gonna come in. We're gonna see what the production's like in, a, in 10 gallon size containers. We also have a variety called Salavatsky. There's a video coming out on the YouTube channel talking about Salavatsky and how that one has survived our winter with a two degree Fahrenheit low with absolutely no damage, not even a single shred of damage. Not even from desiccation. I'm blown away. Salavatsky, a Russian variety of pomegranate, has survived the winter here with no issues. And it's also a reliable fruiter. I know lots of people in 6B. I have four friends in the area in 6B, in a colder part of Pennsylvania than myself, um, that are able to overwinter and ripen a full crop of Salavatsky in their yards. So the, the pomegranates are coming along, hopefully. Um, in addition to this, the, uh, the persimmons, we've got a lot of them planted all throughout the yard. I went nuts. We have about, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're gonna have potentially nine persimmon trees in the ground. Uh, we have a very large Rosianca that is a hybrid, uh, gets through the winter no problem, puts out really tasty fruit, by the way. Has Asian um, Asian Asian persimmon flavor in it, and it is going to bear, I think this is the year. I've also learned that less fertile soil actually will help them bear better. So we're gonna try to decrease the growth as much as we can. I'm gonna, I've been building up the soil in that location for so long. What I'm going to do is actually take away a lot of that mulch and let the tree just grow in the native clay. Uh, believe it or not, that is the, the answer, I think. Um, so we'll let them grow in a less fertile soil. They should be more productive, but also this should be the year for Rosianca. I'm expecting huge numbers of fruit. I'm expecting like 200 fruits just off of that one tree. Um, I think my tree can handle it this year. It is massive, it's super strong, a beautiful form, really well structured. And we're gonna be enjoying, as this picture is showing you guys, dried persimmon all winter. That's the goal. There is nothing uh, except for a date that beats a dried, in terms of dried fruit, there's nothing that beats a dried persimmon. Um, I think dates are up there and are probably better, but uh, you can't grow dates here in Pennsylvania. Anyway, guys, that was this episode of Fruit Talk. These are the goals that I am hoping to achieve this summer in the 2019 season in the garden and in the, the orchard. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for different content. Also, check us out on YouTube if you guys are watching this on uh, any of the podcasting sites. Just check us out on YouTube. Subscribe. Like this video if you are watching on YouTube. Also, visit the website, rossratty.wixsite.com slash blog in the description of this video. We have a nice blog post there. We're going to keep that updated. Really different content than what you're normally seeing in the podcast and def definitely different content than what you're seeing on these videos. You can also subscribe there, get notified on the new blog post, as well as check out our consulting page. We're offering consulting services for those looking to start a backyard orchard. Uh, we also have plants and cuttings for sale, as I mentioned, on the website that will take you to the link to FigBid and where you can check out our listings of different plants and different cuttings for sale. Lastly, I just want to plug our Patreon page. If you want to become a patron, I would certainly appreciate it. really helps out. Any little bit that you guys can offer really, really does help. And uh, I want to thank everybody again for watching. This was Fruit Talk with Ross Ratty. Hope to see you all soon. See you next week. Take care.